All right, if you're just joining us, we're talking about atoms. And I wrote that stuff. So there you go. So <clears throat> atom is considered, he's like, who, I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> Sorry, so if you're just joining us, see, here's the class. <laughs> and he's trying to figure out who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you on YouTube. So, and there's a camera behind you. So, all right, the atom is considered to be the most basic building block of all matter. Atoms consist of three subatomic particles, which are protons, neutrons, and electrons. All right. So if we were to draw a simple photo, or a picture, I should say, of, of an atom, well, we would start with the little nucleus, the nougat center, if you will. We'll just draw that right there. And inside of there, we have the what in there? Neutrons and photons. We have neutrons, so we'll make a little green end because it's too small to put a little Switzerland flag. So neutrons and then protons. Protons have what kind of charge? Positive. Positive. We'll put a P right there, but that's P. We can put a little positive P plus. Positive for uh, the protons have a positive charge. And then floating around, orbiting I should say, orbiting around the nucleus we have Electrons, I'll just put a little negative here. And because it has to be balanced, or it should be balanced, we have two neutrons, two protons, and two electrons floating around. And I don't know. What did I make right there? Is it helium? Helium, I think it's one, or is it two? 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 Okay. So that's probably a helium right there that I just made. So, hey, good for me. All right. <laughs> so, and as we've discussed before, but I shall repeat, <coughs> excuse me, is that we're going to use a simple 2D model. And we're going to represent that these little electrons are basically going around in an orbit much like the planet rotates around the sun. I said that wrong last <laughs> 309. Much like the sun rotates around the earth. Um, <coughs> so, no, like the sun would rotate around I said again, the Earth would rotate around the Sun, or the Moon around the Moon around the Earth. So they just kind of do this nice little orbit. Well, that's not true, right? So in later models, it's more of a 3D kind of spinning around thing. But in truth, these things actually buzz around quite a bit. But they have a probability of where they're located, which sort of falls in line with that. But just so you know that it's a lot more complicated than what we're doing. But this is completely adequate for our explanation and understanding. So we have, uh, let's see, can three so we have the nucleus. I didn't write that yet. Nucleus. And you see L E U S. The nucleus contains what is the center of the atom? Center of the atom. It contains protons. So it's not painted P pro. Protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged. while neutrons are neutral charged. <clears throat> and then outside of the nucleus, we have the floating around, orbiting electrons. electrons. The electrons. And electrons have have a what kind of charge? Negative. negative. A negative charge. I don't know why I put this here. I don't know, but we'll stick with it. So more about the nucleus. All right, went a little overboard here. More about the nucleus. <clears throat> One, 
the number of protons, and thus the number of electrons, that number of protons, And thus, the number of electrons, we could also say neutrons too, but number of electrons. And thus, the number of electrons can be determined determined by the periodic table. Of, of elements. And at one point in this class, I thought, oh, this would be a great time to get into the periodic table of elements and start discussing it and what it all meant and how it was arranged. And then I thought about that and I thought and that was a mistake. So we don't need to do that. So that's not important. So we'll stick to the important stuff. The arrangement. The arrangement of electrons, of the electrons, can also be determined by the periodic table of elements, periodic table of elements. And what I mean about the arrangements is something we'll talk about a little bit more about as we move along here. But we talked about in 309, if you remember, we talked about the shells, how you have a shell, then another shell, another shell. So we're going to get back into that. But that's how they're arranged, these electrons, because they're not just all circle in one circle. Uh, so, and this is what I was talking about a little bit ago about the Schrodinger. The, The Schrodinger's model. Who was named? Who was that named after? The cat. I'll take that. <laughs> he was a dead cat, or he was not dead cat. Correct. We'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know. Uh, let me see. Places electrons. Places. P L A C. Places electrons. But you know what I was going to say. It was named after <laughs> Dr. Albert Model. So anyway, but uh, OK. Uh, places electrons in, electrons in a probability probability cloud, probability, uh, meaning they're found in an area. And not just going around in this nice little clean orbit that works so well. However, it was Bohr, Bohr's model, named after. Wow, pig. <laughs> uses a, no, this is the other guy. Uh, uses a, a fixed orbit theory. Uh, we will use this more, we will use this more simplistic theory. Oops, I forgot we're recording, so I can't write in that little box down there. <clears throat> So that is Bohr's model. Bohr's model uses the fixed orbit theory. And so the Bohr model uses orbits or shells. Model uses orbits or shells. So if I say an orbit or a shell, it's the same thing. Caught up. 
I got to figure out who my pace car is in here. My slow riders. So I don't go too fast. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. Six. The maximum number of electrons per shell is determined by the formula two n squared two n squared where n is the shell counting from the inside outward. So the first shell, the first shell, has how many electrons maximum? Well, that's two times one squared. So that would equal? Two. One times one is one. One times two is? Two. two. All right. So the second shell would be B. The second shell would be 2 times 2 squared, which equals 2 to 4, 4 is 8. eight. The sh third shell would then be 18. 18. And the fourth is? 32. All right, hopefully everybody see, can see where I got that from. A, B, C, D. All right. Okay, um, electrons. Oh, misprint there. Electrons do not necessarily have to fill up a shell. Need to fill a shell um, before moving to the next. Which is to say, if you had a whole bunch of electrons you don't have to have 2, then 8, then 18, then 32. You could have 2, 8, 8, and 32, or some different combination. But it doesn't have to fill up as you go, so don't expect to see that. It kind of does, but not always. Okay. The outermost shell, what is the outermost shell called? A good job. The outermost. The outermost sh uh, shell, the electrons, are called valence electrons. There's a lot of aircraft activity out there tonight. I don't understand how you're getting into those numbers. Ah, thank you for asking. The eight, eight, two, eight, eight, eighteen, and thirty-two. Okay. <laughs> so, using this formula right here, two yes. n squared. The n represents which shell you're at. So there's like the first. Let me do this. Like here's the uh, neutron. Like here's shell one. Then shell two, then shell three is out here. I'll just do it like that. No, okay. So I want to know how many electrons can go in that first shell, this number one right here. Okay, so it's shell one, Ooh, right there. And so I just plug that one in where the n is, right? So then I do the the formula, 
So remember, exponents first, so that's one squared. So one times one is one, right. times two, so I get two. So I can have two electrons in the very first ring. Okay, now the second ring, right there, the two. So I plug in two for the n. So that's two times two is four. Four times two is eight, so eight. So the very next ring, I can have eight electrons out there. Okay, then I go to the third ring, which is two times three squared. Okay. So nine times two is 18, and then four squared, which is 16 times two, which is 32. So uh, let's see, outermost shell called the valence electrons, or we can call it the valence ring as well. Uh, well, electrons are ele valence electrons, and they're in the valence ring. <clears throat> All right, so we have these. There we go. No electrons that are high energy electrons. You have a lot of energy. They kind of had a couple cups of coffee, followed by a few Red Bulls. What's stronger than a Red Bull? That monster drink? Is that is that worse? I never drink those things. I'd probably have a heart attack. Yeah. Huh? Work out? Do I work out? <laughs> pre workout. Like pre, pre workout. Pre workout. 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams of caffeine. But if you combine that with an espresso. Actually, I read something there's not that much caffeine in an espresso. Oh, but they work. I know, they taste good too. They're delicious. If there's not that much, how do they work? Do I work out? I'm, I'm trying for that kind of. He might work out, but he also doesn't go past cake. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they have a lot of energy. That was where I was going with that. Yes, lots of caffeine. It's, they're buzzing around uh, like a four-year-old after a cake. I went to a four-year-old birthday party this weekend. And so the laws of repulsion and attraction are at work. So opposites do what? Attract. Attract. And likes? Repel. Repel. So we could look at this and say, well, that's why I drew this with one electron over here, one over here, because they're repelling each other. And so they're just kind of staying away. They're not going to want to collide and be next to each other. They are being pushed away from each other. Uh, but at the same time, we have the proton in there, which is actually an attraction. So what keeps it from just ink and sticking to it? Well, the electron has far too much energy for that just like a four-year-old hopped up on cake and sugar, um, try to stick next to their parents, it doesn't happen. They just buzz around the parent, and but they don't go too far, so it's very much like that. Uh, if you have children, you understand that. So, um, But yet the children sort of repulse each other. That's a really good analogy. And so they're repulsing, but the uh, same time there is this attraction so that the little child slash electron doesn't go too far off, they kind of orbit the parent. So that's why they're sticking around, because there is some attraction going on there. But not enough that it'll stick to it, you know. Heaven forbid. Um, unless they need money, then that's, uh, never mind. But uh, let me see. Where did I leave off? Oh, because, because. Because of the laws uh, of attraction and repulsion. Attraction and repulsion. The positive charge, the positive, positive charge, no, I'll say charge, positive charge uh, of the proton, of the proton attracts the electron. But the orbital energy, but of the electron keeps from being drawn into it. Orbital energy of the electron keeps it from being drawn into the proton. Right. 
if, if the number of electrons equals the number of protons, the atom is neutral. If the number of electrons equals the number of protons, the atom is neutral. If you have an extra electron, it is a negatively charged ion. An extra electron is a negatively charged ion. An extra proton, or a deficiency of electron, is another way of looking at it. Is a positively charged ion. All right, dang electrons are fast. How fast are they? Super fast. Electrons are moving. Moving at at uh, about the speed of light. Which is one hundred and eighty six thousand miles per second. All of that to say that, depending on how many electrons, depending on how many electrons around the atom will determine if it is an insulator or conductor. So how many electrons there are. There are and how they are arranged. Around the atom. We'll determine if the atom is an insulator or conductor. We'll determine if the atom is an insulator or conductor. Which one's better, insulator or conductor? Exactly. Depends on if you want to move electrons or if you want to prevent them from moving. Do you want to get shocked or do you want to not get shocked? <laughs> so a conductor. will allow movements of electrons. Is that from one atom to the next? Yes. And an insulator will prohibit flow of electrons. To a point, you put enough voltage through anything, it'll move electrons. I think. Air is an insulator. Put enough voltage on there, you get lightning. 
All right, electrical flow. Told you be easy, just repeat. Mm -hmm. Review. So electricity Electricity is the movement of electrons from one atom to the other. Electricity is the movement of electrons, which have a what kind of charge? Negative. Okay. From one atom to another. One atom to another. The fundamental principle is attraction and repulsion. And as we already said, unlike charges, do what? Attract. Oh, and like yes. <laughs> charges. Repel. 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 I actually had more to write in there. I just was. Unlike charges attract, see, protons attract electrons and create stability. And like charges repel, electrons repel electrons and create current flow. So we can. Everybody done writing? I got to move over. Good. I'm going to repeat that. Do it right this time. So I said, um, unlike, let me say, let me start with, unlike charges attract. You already wrote this. Mm -hmm. And I should have wrote protons attract Electron. electrons and create stability. That's uh, in the orbit or in the shell. Stability. The whole it makes the whole atom stable. Mm -hmm. And then I said, uh, like charges repel. And then my point behind that would be, electrons repel electrons. Repel electrons. And create current flow. That I don't know. Did the proton say say it again? Like what, what holds the protons together in the nucleus? The, the glue. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Now back on track. Point three. Um, if two electrons, we should have had more exact on this, but electrons the size of a P were placed 100 feet apart, they would repel, they would repel with tons of force. I don't know how many tons, but even one would be an awful lot. All right, C, direction of current flow. C, 
So as a review, if we have a battery, what kind of battery is that? Multi-cell. Very good, multi-cell. All right, we have a battery and a wire, and we'll enlarge the wire, supersize. So we can see in there through a magnifying glass. And we have all of these little, we'll make, well, we can make them red. There, all these little nucleus in there. And floating around the nucleus would be the electrons. So the nucleus, all my little electrons. All right, and so this top side of the battery is positive or negative? Positive. Positive, the long side, and the bottom side is? Negative. All right. So uh, we kind of get used to this. So this is a what now? It's called a ground. And if I do that and I bring this over here and I do the same thing, it means that these two are technically connected. Yes. Of the battery? Yes. Convention is drawn that way. The difference is the big line. The, it's a big line. If I drew it like this, then the top side is? That's the negative. And this is the positive. So is the, the long line's the positive. That looks nicer. All right. So the ground, when you see that symbol, it's a shortcut rather than drawing a line that goes all the way across. So you do that and you get a shortcut and that saves time. And when you save time, you can see world. Kelly's like, what are you guys talking about? All right, so given that, right, we have a positive here and a negative here, that means that if like charges repel, then the electrons are being pushed that way, right? Because the battery is gonna have a def uh, an excess of electrons on the negative plate and a deficiency of electrons on the positive plate. That's why it's positive and the other one's negative. So we're, we're missing electrons here on this positive plate. So it's positive. So it is going to do what to the electrons? It's gonna suck them in, right? It's gonna suck those electrons in this way because it's short, it, it's missing them, right? Deficient. This one has too many, so it's gonna repel. And so if it's gonna repel electrons, it's gonna go that way. So which is to say that the flow of current is from from negative to positive. So where am I here? So the electricity is the flow of electrons. Electrons, which are negative charge. Electrons. Electrons repel towards the positive. Electrons repel toward toward a positive. Well, they're being drawn towards it, I guess we could say. Um, electron deficient. Electron deficient. Uh, charge and let me see yeah they repel that makes sense they repel towards the positive so they're pushing that way and pushing it towards the positive so therefore the electricity flows from negative to positive. And what theory is that called? All right. Electron flow theory. Uh, conventional, so we'll call this one the conventional. Flow theory 
is positive to negative. That was before we picked out those opposite. And by we, we mean they. Yes, <laughs> them. So we're talking about the electricity stuff that we're working on, you know, diodes and LEDs, which are a diode, and resistors and motors and all that kind of stuff. Does it really matter if you trace it correctly or if you go negative to positive or positive to negative? Yeah. No. And the reason why I say no is and I don't know a lot about digital electronics, but when you get into digital and stuff, obviously it's going to really matter. But for our purpose, you obviously have to connect things correctly. So I'm not talking about connecting it wrong, like, hey, positive, it doesn't matter. Um, it'll figure it out. You obviously have to cor connect it correctly where it matters, right? You can't, uh, can't screw that up. But if you're looking at a schematic, if you're talking about something and you're tracing it out, you can trace it out, you can talk about it as if it goes conventional, positive to negative, or you can talk about it in electron where it goes negative to positive. Honestly, I feel that almost all schematics were drawn in such a way that it makes way more sense to go conventional. Start at the battery, because you have a wire that is gonna direct you over to the component. You can follow it and go, okay, it goes battery, um, circuit breaker, fuse, uh, a switch, a relay, a component, and you go to ground, right? If you do it the other way around, you got to start the battery, which goes right to ground. Then you got to come around and, well, okay, now where's it going to come up at? And you got to find the right ground. You start this ground, go, no, nope, that's the wrong circuit. This, try this one, no, nope, wrong circuit. Okay, oh, here it is. Now it's the right circuit. Then the component, you know, then the wire, then the circuit breaker, then the switch, then the bus. And you, so it just doesn't make sense to go backwards. It makes way more sense to follow it forward because that's where the wire is. Otherwise, when you look at it, all you're going to see is just a ground coming off the battery, and then you've got to pick up the right, and remember, because everything's in parallel, so everything's going to be a whole other circuit. You've got to find the right ground to come up. Way easier to just go this way, across, and down. Is that like troubleshooting? Oh, yeah. Yep, troubleshooting. Anyway, that's my opinion. You don't have to do it that way. But you're, I won't say you're wrong if you go conventional, and you're like, okay, so it comes out of the battery, goes this way. I'm not going to correct you. You know, you know that you know the difference now. Everybody knows the difference. If you want to go that way, I'm totally fine with it. All right, D, electrical properties. So we have three types. Three types of. I finish that. Yeah, I did three types of. Three types of electrical properties. One, we've got the conductor. Also called a what? Wire. Wire. Has less than, has less than one half of allowable, of allowable valence electrons. And that is because when you go outwards and you get out to these shells that are getting further away from the, from the nucleus, these uh, electrons, they're not so much attracted to the proton that is now getting further and further away. So they're kind of a wandering electron or a free electron, if you will. And so it's easy to bump them off to the next one because they're not so tightly held. So when you get out there and you don't have a bunch of them, that you lose your stability and you lose your stability, then the electrons easily transfer across to the next electron. And when you can get the electrons transferring from one electron to the next very easily, you have a very nice conductor. If you didn't have a conductor that did that and you couldn't flick the electrons off very easily, then you would need a lot of voltage to convince them to move. And if you needed a lot of voltage to do that, that would indicate that the wire has a lot of resistance 
and that would not be good. So we want a wire with not a lot of resistance because resistance shows up in your lab as something on a meter. It shows up in real life as heat and bad things. So uh, like for example, my airplane, one of, the, one of the things I don't love about the 182 and some of the Cessnas is they put the battery all the way in the back. And where's the starter? All the way in the front. So you got the battery all the way back there. And so the battery wire's got to go down, uh, the starter wire, down all the way to the front of the airplane, up through a solenoid and across and into a starter. So that's a long run. And if you were to take that wire and pull it out of the aircraft and you were to measure it with your uh, ohmmeter, you would probably measure nothing. You know, you'd zero out your meter, measure it. Maybe the meter, it'd go almost all the way to zero, and you go, ah, it's got zero. But when you talk about Ohm's law and you start looking at things a little bit differently, you start seeing it different and figuring out different. Um, so, for example, this is a, a great example, um, getting off topic a little bit, but this is kind of important. So, let's say you go to start your car, right? And you're, ah, break time. We'll come back. Talk about the car in a little bit. Ready?